I'll say it. I think that the trend with van conversions lately has lost its way. And I'll explain why, but for context, let's take stock of what I've done on my van so far and the reasons my decisions might seem off piste. So, remedial rust repairs aside, the conversion started in earnest with the addition of six Land Rover Alpine windows, four at the front, two in the back. And I then installed an engineered wood floor without the inch thick pink insulation you absolutely have to use if the internet has anything to do with it. There are two reasons for that. One is that a 2002 Sprinter van without any floor installed is only barely tall enough inside for a six foot person to stand up in comfortably. And the other leads me to the next phase of the conversion. I installed minibus seats with built in seat belts that lock into rails that bow through the floor. Call me cautious, but I don't want a layer of foam between my precious cargo and a hard fixing. And as far as choosing minibus seats instead of the built-in banquette style you see in most every camper, I want space. I want to be able to stretch out my legs. I want my kid to be able to play around on the floor if we're stuck inside on a rainy evening. So my minibus seats can move and be modular or be deleted altogether with the flick of a lever and I'm left with floor space. Sure, there'll be bench seating too, actually a lounge if I can pull it off, but you'll see no domestic scale kitchen cabinets or countertops here. I'm building a camper, a mobile space to duck out for a weekend in, and if I ever spend more than three or four days living out of this thing, I'll eat my hat. And when I do duck out, realistically, it won't be to the Sahara or the South Pole. I'll be going places where the water and the pub or eatery are equidistant walks. There will be a wet room in this build, that's for sure, but no toilet. So now we're caught up, and you might still be wondering, well, why did you delete the factory bulkhead only to reinstate a bulkhead? Here's yet another thing I think most large scale van conversions get wrong. My van is big. I mean, obscenely big, if I'm honest. It's too big for really easy use as a camper, but then I'm a guy who spent three months living out of an old T2 Westphalia bus. I've got plenty of space, so I'll happily trade the potential for two extra seats against solving the problems created by opening the cab into the living space. See, the front cab of any van is glass. I mean, it's predominantly glass. That's a massive heatsink, not to mention a condensation trap. Sealing that off from the living space manages both heat and air quality in that living space and also ensures that your cab heater, that comparatively weedy thing built into the dashboard, will be capable of actually heating the cab in freezing conditions while on the move. Sound is another consideration. Time and again people choose to fork out strong money on heavy bituminous or rubber vibration damping sheets that get bonded to the load area panels before insulation and panelling go in. Well weight is a real concern on a conversion like this, especially if you want your fridge freezer below your house size kitchen counter complete with tiled backsplash. You can't throw all mod cons on a van complete with associated electrics, insulation, heavy soundproofing and entertainment and then throw a set of all-terrain tires on it and expect it to be efficient on-road and capable off-road. A well-designed bulkhead keeps expense, weight and noise levels down while making the spaces either side of it more easily heated or cooled as the case may be. So you could say in a nutshell, I'm attacking this van with the Lotus ethos. Simplify and then add lightness. And by the way, if it's Lotus you're after here at Soup Classic Motoring, there aren't that many more sleeps left. Expect a return to the Esprit project in roughly three episodes time and no more distractions. If you have another birthday before I finish and drive that car, it's because your birthday's wrong. It's how things have been lately. Big winds, big tides and low temperatures. I gave you a minute to think there and I'm not surprised if you were looking at my bulkhead and thinking lightweight, yeah, but well designed. 
it's a little flimsy that's for sure but it's also compromised for all my big talk so in this episode i'm going to reinforce it make it more versatile and try and build a door in it that not only allows the bulk bed tm to function but that has some beauty to it too
if I had to pick one word to describe it, the theme for this interior, well, let's call it nautical. I want the door to look like a watertight bulkhead door from a ship, but with a salute to a beach hut, and for that I have a trick up my sleeve. You might remember I have access to old out of commission pianos, and a long time ago I saved a beautiful and very old front panel from a Joanna that was destined for the big sing-along in the sky. It's been squirreled away, awaiting just the right project. And this is it. This is a parliament hinge. That was new tech to me. It's specifically intended to offset the pivot point of a door so that the door itself will clear a large frame or other obstacle. And it's what's going to allow the door to open and swing flat against the bulkhead even when the top half is folded down.
not a woodworker. That's stating the obvious. I find it very unforgiving. It's a win then that all of the little scratches, chips, uneven lines and rough edges you see here only lend themselves to the vibe I want this interior to have. I'll probably splash a lick of white paint here and there when all the structure is done, just to help some of the reclaimed wood pop. And for now, I'm really happy that this little piece of bygone artistry has a new place to live and be seen. There are a few little pieces of fretwork missing that I'll save trying to repair for a rainy day once all this is finished. That'll be a challenge. And I originally wanted to cut corresponding holes in the backboard of the door to let the light through, but I just don't think doing that is in the best interests of the old panel. I'd be afraid it would get a knock and have no support. So I'm thinking, a piece of turquoise satin between the fretwork of the panel and the backboard would be a nice way to accentuate it but that again is for another day. Hey, an interesting thing about the panel that my buddy Mark the Piano Man told me is that where you see the white paint rubbed into the carved pattern detail would have been mother of pearl or abalone. People would pry it out way back when because they thought it would be worth money. Pity. Just think of the time and effort that would have gone into inlaying strands of seashell into a piece like this. Anyway, that's me for another installment. I've made quite the mess. Okay, I'll admit it. I had cleaned up a bit and scattered the rubble back across the floor for effect, but there's plenty more mess to be made, so no harm, no foul. To my new patrons, Bob Griffin, Tony Banbury, Trevor Hare, Neil Dugood, Christopher DeBar, Bilson Campana, Jack Gerritsen, and Robert Dowling, thank you. You're more important than ever, and probably more neglected than ever too. I meant what I said, the Esprit project is looming and this time I must finish before I'm too old to actually be able to get in and out of it. So until next time, embrace the weather, whatever you're getting, stay stuck in and good luck. <laughs>